if if you can bring in some humor, that does a huge amount to alleviate some of that fear or anxiety. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So, Andrew, you are known as the funny guy. In some circles, I suppose. <laughs> uh, you know, it is funny. I'll be at a convention and some kid will walk up to me. And if they say something like, I watch your videos, uh-huh. usually I will respond by saying, what do you dislike the most about them? Mm-hmm. Which, of course, takes them off guard because it's unexpected. It's a form of humor. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they may or may not say anything. Sometimes they'll just walk up and say, oh, I watch your videos. I really like them. Mm -hmm. In which case I will say, well, what do you what do you like the most? Mm -hmm. Almost all the time the answer is you're funny. (laughs) Yes, it's true. So children love to laugh. Yep. And they they appreciate when there is a humorous element Mm -hmm. to something that they have to do or that something they're trying to learn. And I I have long noted that if you can keep people with a chuckle, Mm -hmm. you know, periodically, they just tend to pay attention better. They're they're kind of waiting for the next funny thing. And so you get these spaces between funny things where people are more attentive than if not. Yeah, sure. And – I don't know if it's a cheap trick or not, but <laughs> it served me well for decades of teaching. Right. And of course, with our structured style for students videos, which is probably what those kids are referring to, you start just about every week with at least a joke or two. Well, and I hope that there are other humorous moments oh, yes. in between. Definitely sprinkled Assuming throughout. you have not edited them all out. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, even before the new products, yeah. I, I had people saying that. And, sure. You know, I think back to some of the g- significant influences on me. One of them would be Dr. Shinichi Suzuki, mm. founder of Suzuki Method, and I lived in Japan. And he had just crazy antics. Oh. Even at 80 years old, he uh-huh. would do silly, funny stuff huh. with children. And he just loved it, and they just loved it, and everybody just loved him. And he'd even do funny, silly stuff with us as Mm -hmm. adult, you know, young adults, teacher, trainer, training program. And um, so I've just always respected people who can keep you engaged and keep you smiling the whole time. So it's kind of been something I I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, this is learnable. You know, some people have a better sense of humor. They're more inclined to see or say something humorous than others, but everybody can learn. Mm-hmm. So I created this talk, Humor in Teaching and Speaking. Oh, uh-huh. And uh, I did it at conventions for a while. I mean, I'd still do it if anybody asked. <laughs> and I thought, well, worst case scenario, I just tell a few jokes and that'll be okay. But uh, in the process of preparing for that, I did research and read all sorts of things about the health benefits, Mm. the emotional benefits, the organizational and educational benefits of uh, including humor Hmm. in your communication. So, you know, we could start with that. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Evidently, laughter has some physiological benefits. Sure. Lowers stress, lowers blood pressure. Increases immune system response, Mm. antibodies, strengthens the heart, and increases attentiveness. Mm. It has 
an effect on the body similar to exercise. Oh, interesting. And actually, if you laugh hard enough, you are exercising your diaphragm, your abdominal muscles, your respiratory function. And while we don't often have things that make us laugh for long periods of time, there's research to prove that extended laughter has these measurable physiological benefits. Mm. So a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, as the good book says. Yeah, I I think so. Mm -hmm. Um, There are stories of people using laughter to treat disease. Mm. In fact, one of the better known books, uh, Norman Cousins wrote Anatomy of an Illness, Mm. and basically about how he used laughter as a major part of a treatment program he designed for himself Mm -hmm. to essentially cure what was thought to be an uncurable illness. Yeah, yeah. Um, But we also know that there are endorphins released, so there's Mm -hmm. a a, a neurophysiological element that helps to reduce pain sensitivity. So, you know, there's there's when when we're laughing we don't feel pain in the same way now how do you get yourself to laugh well uh you could do as norman cousins did which was watch i love lucy reruns for 6 hours a day <laughs> oh, wow um or something like that although uh, that might be more painful for me <laughs> <clears throat> but you you can intentionally look for things mm-hmm. that help people laugh. There's even – I know this is going to sound ridiculous to, to you, to many people, but there are laughter clubs oh. in different parts of the world. You can actually see this uh, on video hmm. on the internet. Of groups of people, I think it started in India, I think they have these groups now in China and in America and other places, of people who will kind of gather together and just start laughing, Hmm. like in a circle Mm -hmm. at a park or something, Mm -hmm. and then just keep laughing for, you know, 20 minutes or so. Yeah, there's nothing funnier than watching someone laugh and joining them in it, really. Well, and it's so much easier to laugh when someone else is laughing. Exactly. Right? Which yep. is where the whole idea of laugh tracks came mm. in to sitcoms yes. <laughs> um, 50 years ago. Like, Some of them are so ridiculous, though. You just Why groan. are they yeah. doing that? Yeah. And yet it is easier to laugh when you're mm-hmm. laughing with someone. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, there's these physiological benefits emotional benefits. When people laugh together, it lowers their stress. It helps people bond Oh, sure. during yeah. hardships. Mm-hmm. It tends to dissolve anger. So it's really hard to be angry and laughing right. at the same time. <laughs> right. <laughs> so if, if you are laughing, then it tends to dissipate anger or resentfulness or anxiety. And I think that a lot of times when we're teaching kids, you know, especially if it's a subject that they have anxiety about, whether that's, you know, math or writing, writing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if you can bring in some humor, mm-hmm. that does a huge amount to alleviate some of that fear or anxiety or tendency to be depressed about it. And, you know, if you watch any of the kind of teacher hero movies, Mm -hmm. uh, there are common elements there that the the teacher hero will bring into the classroom. One of those is games and the other is humor. And so, you know, I have seen that. But – from from a social perspective, there's many studies that have showed that organizationally, when you look at bringing people into a room and having them work together, laughter increases participation, increases trust and likability, increases teamwork and creativity. So I should start all of my meetings with a joke. 
you could, um, <laughs> but you're you're one of those easy to laugh people anyway, and you just <laughs> smile and you brighten up a room. And, mm. uh, but you know, I think people just do look forward mm-hmm. to that, and when they can joke with each other. There's just a bonding mm-hmm. that happens. Well, and I, I should mention this to our listeners and any of you that want to come work for us. One of the things that Andrew loves to do is walk down the hall and tell the team the latest joke that he's heard that day. So. Well, you have to practice on someone. <laughs> um, but there, there is something that we all appreciate. One of my concerns about the modern climate mm. is that we we kind of have become so hypersensitive that some of the things that are really honestly innocent and humorous because we're poking fun yeah. at ourselves or something right. are now dangerous. Yeah. And so, you know, the end of satire yeah. is a sad thing. When we can't laugh at ourselves individually, mm-hmm. that's a problem. When we can't laugh at ourselves Corporately, mm-hmm. that's also a loss. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we, we obviously don't want to be cruel in any way. But humor, what is humor? That, I, that was my question. What makes something funny? Right. And there is a word to describe the science of laughter and relatedly humor and that is a word from the Greek root gelo or jello, G-E-L-O. Uh, so you'd pronounce it gelotology or mm. gelotology. Mm-hmm. And so people have been studying this. It's uh, not a very funny word. <laughs> no, it isn't. There, there's even an international humor association. Interesting. And they have a convention. Okay. Or they used to. I don't know if mm-hmm. COVID killed it. But um, – <laughs> And I thought I, I would fly to New York to go to that International Humor Association convention uh, just to learn more about, you know, what do people talk about when they gather together to discuss right. what makes things funny and how right. to be funny and what's the value of it right. uh, on our world today. So to boil it all down, humor is essentially benign tragedy. So it's when something is horrible, only it really isn't. Okay. Right? You, you see this in the slapstick physical humor that I remember from a child, Roadrunner and Coyote. Okay, sure. Right? Yep, yep. So what are they doing? They're basically dying again and again <laughs> and again, doing these ridiculous things. Like, no, only the coyotes die. Like, oh, okay. Well, getting doesn't. blown up with dynamite or <laughs> falling off a cliff, mm-hmm. only they don't, mm-hmm. right? So there's this tragedy, mm. but it's benign. Mm-hmm. Uh, you think about uh, Laurel and Hardy or the Three Stooges or right. Charlie Chaplin, that type of physical humor. Or even I Love Lucy that Norman Cousins was watching. Yeah. Right. So, you know, if if I trip and fall down the stairs and I'm fine, mm-hmm. that could be funny. If I trip and fall down the stairs and break my neck and I'm paralyzed for the rest of my life, that is distinctly not, not funny. funny. Yeah. So when you're looking at the different kinds of humor – you're saying, okay, so where's the benign tragedy element there, hmm. right? Um, so I came up with, what do I have here? Ten, I think, different categories oh, okay. of humor. And, you know, we can whip through these. Because if you're trying to learn to be more humorous, you want to kind of have categorical ideas Okay. As to how that might happen. So one thing that we find very charming is misunderstandings, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Young children often will have a misunderstanding about something. Mm -hmm. And uh, they may, you know, say something like, well, was it the Virgin Mary or the King James Virgin? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Virgin, version, Mm -hmm. right? Right, yep. Uh, Or... Uh, this was from uh, – there, there's an absolutely hilarious book by Richard Letterer called Anguished 
English. Okay. <laughs> and this is this is. I mean, if you wanted to buy one thing to make you laugh, I would buy that mm-hmm. tiny little book. But he um, he Link wrote a lot of notes. books. There's Anguish English, More Anguish English, Adventures of a Verbivore, mm. um, Crazy <laughs> English. But he spent years and years collecting up stuff. And and one of the sections of Anguish Anguished English is things written in student papers. Oh, sure, yeah. And these are either misunderstandings or sometimes typos, mm-hmm. right? For example, in 19th century Russia, the pheasants led terrible <laughs> lives. <laughs> or a triangle of 135 degrees is called an obscene triangle. <laughs> and, of course, a virtuoso would be a musician with very high morals. <laughs> yes. Okay, so you're seeing the mix-up of words. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, I suppose in some cases intentional, but it's probably Mm -hmm. that kind of innocent misstatement, confusion about vocabulary and all Mm -hmm. that. Sure. Another category would be impossible absurdities. One of my favorite poems when I was very young and a poem that my son really liked when he was very young was The Little Old Man of the Sea. Oh, Okay. Little old man of the sea went out in his boat for a sail. The water came in almost up to his chin. He had nothing with which to bail. But this little old man of the sea, he took up his jackknife so stout, and a hole with its blade in the bottom he made so that all of the water ran out. (laughs) Okay, why is that humorous or funny or enjoyable? Because it's kind of absurd to cut a hole in your boat to get the water out because everybody knows, right? So right. there's that. Um, there's a Canadian comedian who kind of sp- had a, a, a good way with this. He, he would say things like, my friend had a pet elephant, but he lost it somewhere in his apartment. <laughs> right? So it goes from absurd to more absurd to, to completely ridiculously absurd. But. Another type of humor would be when you state the obvious unexpectedly, right? Uh, so a statement like this, I, I expected to enjoy that movie, <clears throat> but that was before I saw it. <laughs> right. Okay, that's kind of obvious, right. but you got to think about it. <laughs> um, one of my favorite writers has a knack of – very subtle humor, and he wrote a book called uh, – or it's a short, short story called The Napoleon of Notting Hill, and the first sentence starts like this. The human race to which so many of my readers belong has been playing at children's games from the beginning. <laughs> many of his readers. <laughs> and I think I was just watching – some YouTube my wife was showing me, and, and the guy started out, hello, humans, <laughs> like, as if there was anyone else, but, you know. It's all the cats watching. <laughs> yeah. Um, another area would be, as I mentioned, unpredictable physical humor. Again, it's kind of benign tragedy. My, uh, my oldest grandchild, when she was very young, like six years old, would eat at our house fairly often, and Mm -hmm. she just would not eat vegetables. She would just move those vegetables around on her plate forever and procrastinate and Mm -hmm. scoop them onto the floor. And I remember one time in particular, I said to her, "If if you ate all those carrots, I would fall off my chair. Well, this set it up, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So now she would rather see me (laughs) fall off the chair then suffer the carrots. So she suffers the carrots and <laughs> looks at me like, Poppy, I ate all the carrots. Right, right, right. Now I have to fall off the chair and not actually hurt myself. Well, of course, every single time she came to do it. <laughs> Poppy, I ate all my carrots. I ate all my vegetables. And so I have to fall off the chair. <laughs> Why does she think that's funny? <laughs> I don't know. But it was motivating. It would be Particularly funny today, considering she's a young adult, for you to, <laughs> to, you probably wouldn't do it, would you? I don't even know. 
<laughs> but there, there is that element, you know, and, and I did for a long time this video about sea wasps mm -hmm. and I would pretend to be stung by a sea wasp and paralyzed and I would fall mm -hmm. right on the table, right on the paper of the students at the front table. See, Everyone structure in the room. and style for students, level B, year one, blue ring octopus. Oh, did I do that? Yes, you did. <laughs> uh, I don't remember. But, you know, everyone laughs. Why? I don't know. But there's something funny about, again, benign tragedy. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had actually been stung by a sea wasp and was asphyxiated and dying within the minute or so that I had to live, it, it wouldn't have been funny for very long. No. No, indeed. <laughs> um, another category, I think we're on number five, would be hyperbole and exaggeration, mm. right? And so when you take something to an extreme, it has that ridiculousness about it. You know, I will often, when I'm teaching, say, you know, on one side of the spectrum is the, you know, 18-page kid who would who can go on and on and on and on, and you read it and it goes on and on and on and on. On the other end of the spectrum is the child who would rather scrub all the toilets in the building twice than put a whole paragraph on paper. Mm -hmm. And people chuckle at that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm using hyperbole. I'm exaggerating, although I have had people come up to me afterwards and say, that's not an exaggeration. My son actually would rather scrub all the floors or toilets than have to write a whole paragraph. And I'm sure there are children who have written 18 pages and didn't say a whole lot. <laughs> yeah. On the opposite of exaggeration is understatement, mm -hmm. right? For example, wow, that can really ruin your day, kind of like heat-seeking missiles. <laughs> yeah. Wow, yeah. <laughs> that does more than ruin your day, right? <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, if at first you don't succeed, skydiving is not for you. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay, so you have the kind of mm -hmm. understatement. Mm -hmm. uh, we love, for some reason, plays on words, mm -hmm. puns, double entendres, sign in an optometrist's office. If you don't see what you're looking for, you came to the right place, mm -hmm. right? Or... <laughs> My favorite joke, which you don't really like that much, but I do, why did the egg cross the road? Because it had the inclination. Yes. And so, then you demonstrate with your hand right. that it's an egg incline. rolling yes, yeah, yeah. down a hill. Well, sometimes it takes people a little bit to make the connection. Incline, inclination, inclination yeah. and... So I, I think part of it is our language is so rich mm -hmm. that when we see those double entendre mm -hmm. meanings, mm -hmm. it just delights us. Mm. I think the first time you told that joke and I heard it, you accused me of not getting it. It's like, no, Andrew, that's called a groaner. I got it. It just wasn't funny. <laughs> Maybe it is a little bit. Well, Maybe I just like to bug you and say it's not funny. <laughs> What do you call a fully matured joke? I don't know. Grown up. <laughs> Grown up. That's good. <laughs> Irony is a form of humor that we see used in literature in a subtler way. Mm -hmm. Irony is kind of challenging to create. Uh, that's why you need to study people who do it well. Uh, Mark Twain was yes. probably the master of irony. Uh, reports of my death have been highly exaggerated. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, I, uh, quitting smoking is easy. I've done it hundreds of times. <laughs> In uh, Tom Sawyer, or no, I think it's the beginning of Huck Finn, Tom says to Huck, now, if you'll just go back to the widow and be respectable, you can join my band of robbers. Exactly, yes. <laughs> so, you know, there's that that cognitive dissonance. You're holding two concepts that are opposite, being respectable and joining a band of robbers, right, at the same time there. And then sometimes there's kind of the common sense or what I might call painful truth, mm -hmm. right, things that we don't really like to hear, but, you know, it's 
painful. Yeah. <laughs> and true. <laughs> Churchill said, men occasionally stumble over the truth, but they pick themselves up and continue on as if nothing had happened. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So he's got a metaphor going on there. But yeah, how many times do we do that? Mm -hmm. We see something true, but we don't like it. Mm -hmm. And then, so we just disregard it. Mm -hmm. But Mark Twain said, it's not the things in the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's the things that are perfectly clear that cause me concern. Yes, exactly. Yep. You know, and I think we all you know, can relate to that. So you know, those are subtle, powerful ways to use humor. And then, you know, the last category would be derogation and caricature. Mm -hmm. And I, I grew up in the era of people telling Polak jokes. Mm -hmm. The odd thing about that was I didn't actually know what a Polak was mm -hmm. until I was older. And then, oh, it's a Polish person. Well, I don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out I have a good amount of Polish blood in me probably. Yes. Uh, but people would tell those jokes about some class of mm -hmm. people and then mm -hmm. we see, you know, blonde jokes or lawyer jokes. The, the only people who really can get away with telling those jokes are people in that class. Right, right. Right? So lawyers generally know the most lawyer jokes and blondes know the most blonde jokes and if they tell it, okay, no big deal. Although, it does seem that no one knows any engineer jokes except for engineers. Oh, interesting. So. You're right. <laughs> but when you get to that derogation and caricature, then self-derogation becomes probably the, the only acceptable mm, form mm. of that. Sure, sure. You know, especially in the world today. And, sure. you know, self-deprecation has its place. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes I, I will say things kind of pointing out that I'm not particularly qualified to talk about what I'm talking about, uh, which has a humorous element, but it also protects me from, well, I told you, you know, <laughs> I really don't know all that much. But, mm -hmm. you know, I guess, you know, my my hope is that people listening, especially, I think, homeschool moms, some of them get really serious. And I understand that. There's mm -hmm. a lot of weight mm -hmm. on a homeschool mother to keep everybody organized and on task and productive and mm -hmm. up to grade level. And, you know, the list of, of burdens on a homeschool mom, and by extension, other people who teach kids. But I think it can be the worst there, can can weigh on them. Mm -hmm. And they can gradually kind of get in a rut, lose their sense of mirth. Mm. And I would just encourage people, if you feel like that's happening, just step back, realize all the kids are going to grow up and they're all going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And what maybe you really need to do right at the moment is diffuse the weight mm -hmm. of the situation with a moment of humor. Yep, yep. And you, know, you don't have to make up jokes. I don't make up too many jokes. Most of them I steal, like every <laughs> other good idea that I ever have. Uh, so get yourself a good joke book mm -hmm. and practice up, you know, on your spouse the night before mm -hmm. and then surprise your kids with, you know, a good joke in the morning mm -hmm. or, or challenge them. To, to bring a good joke. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, we used to do like a family meeting. Mm. And I would always try to find something humorous, you know, a poem or a joke or a section of a book and, and just read something humorous. Mm -hmm. But I would finish up with a quote from one of my favorite guys who um, was on the radio mm. for – decades. Mm -hmm. As long as I can remember being an adult, he was there. Mm -hmm. And that's Garrison, Garrison Keeler. Keeler. I think he has retired mm. finally. But he said, jokes are democratic. Telling one right has nothing to do with having money or being educated. It's a knack, like hammering a nail straight. Anyone can learn it. 
and it's useful in all sorts of situations. Mm -hmm. You can go through your whole life and not need trigonometry or physics for a minute, but the ability to tell a joke is always handy. Yes, indeed. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't learn trigonometry and physics. <laughs> right. There are, you know, all sorts of benefits to that. Mm -hmm. But let's not forget that there's a certain humanity yeah. in humor that is helpful in so many different circumstances. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for laughing <laughs> at all my awful jokes. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcasts. Here you can also find show notes and relevant links from today's broadcast. One last thing. Would you mind going to iTunes to rate and review our podcast? This really helps other smart, caring listeners like you find us. Thanks so much.